Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited about our speakers today. I'm looking forward to their messages and how they're uh, coping with the COVID-19 response. So before I introduce the speakers, I have a couple of procedural items that I'd like to go through with you. If you have questions during the talk, please use the Q&A button at the bottom. That's where we'll, we'll uh, collect questions and we will do our best to, to respond to the questions, but at the end of the presentation. We won't be doing questions live in the middle of the presentation, we'll do questions at the end. So please use the question and answer button at the bottom of the webinar. I would ask that you reserve the chat button for if you experience any technical challenges. Uh, our, our specialists will be following the chat function uh, closely to make sure everyone, uh, has, if they have technical challenges, that those will be addressed in real time. This webinar is being recorded. Um, and we'll make it available to the attendees after the session today. So if you'd like to, to watch it again, that it will be av available for you for that reason. And lastly, we will be sending out a, a survey at the conclusion of the presentation today. Um, please, we urge you to take a moment to fill that out, it, give us some feedback, it won't take very long, and it's really helpful in, in helping us know how best to prepare and present webinar information to you of, of these really important topics. So now with the, the procedural business out of the way, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Haley Merriam um, and her team, Alex Cullen and Caitlin Ward. Dr. Haley Merriam cares for patients in both George Washington University Hospital and United Medical Center. In addition, she teaches medical students and residents and is Chief of Wound Care and Hyperbaric Medicine at GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences. I'm also very proud to say that uh, Tananya has earned both her undergraduate degree and her medical degree from Dartmouth. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Haley Merriam. And now I turn, it, turn the program over to you. Thank you, Dean Compton. Um, it's good to be back in Hanover, uh, albeit virtually, but we're doing so many things virtually these days. Uh, at least we can see behind Dean Compton, the mountains of New Hampshire. And it's uplifting because here in Washington, DC, it's starting to get warm, but it's starting to get even muggier quicker than it's getting warm. So it's nice to see the cool, crisp mountain air behind you, virtually, of course. Today, we are coming to you uh, as a team. Uh, I've got my wonderful colleagues, Alex Cullen and uh, Caitlin Ward. Together for the last couple of months, we've been on what is now referred to as the front lines of this war against a virus. But it's really been a series of battles against many of the things that have plagued us over the years as we practice urban emergency medicine. We hope we can give you a flavor of that. But what it really has done the last couple of months of, as we've hunkered down to try to figure out how we're going to go about doing the things that we have been taught to do, that we've been trained to do and that we love to do, is that the most important things are that we stay strong and respectful as a team and that we keep our eyes and ears open so that we can pick up on problems and we can come up with solutions many times ourselves because sometimes the solutions don't come from the places you might expect them to come from. And sometimes you find that you yourself, much to your surprise, you are the solution. So. With that frame, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the place where we work. We are in the Department of Emergency Medicine at GW. Um, our department has three major functions, education and training, and of course, clinical service, and we do do research. We're one of the first residency programs established many decades ago. We have 10 fellowship programs 
including um, international emergency medicine, operational and disaster medicine, telemedicine, and so on. We staff four clinical sites locally, uh, George Washington, the main university hospital, the VA hospital in town, Bethesda Naval, and United Medical Center, which is uh, the only city-owned, quote-unquote, public, quote-unquote, hospital in Washington. We also have an Institute of Emergency Medicine, which is the vehicle through which we do many of, much of our international work, as well as our research. Our international work has become very important to all of us. We do training for residencies abroad. We've trained hundreds of doctors in, in different countries in the specialty of emergency medicine, as well as EMT training. And Alex has been all over the world training, training people on how to be first responders. And that's really been an important part of our work. Telemedicine, which has now come to the forefront has been a big part of our work because we've done distance-based uh, medicine for uh, probably thousands at this point of ships around the world, as well as expeditions to places like Antarctica, NOAA expeditions, et cetera, as well as people that have been um, on the forefronts of other kinds of wars that we've given uh, medical uh, instruction and guidance to. And then lastly, DC being a town of many, many events and functions, we have an arm of outreach medicine where we do um, street-based medicine for parades and conventions and so on, and sometimes very fancy-based medicines when people have inaugural balls and such. So we wouldn't call that street-based medicine, but um, banquet-based medicine. Um, so we have a, a, a long line of work, sorry about that. Alex, if you could just tell us a little bit about you, the city, and what you do here. So hi everybody, my name is Alex Cullen. Um, I came to DC for undergraduate at GW and stuck around. Uh, and so I, I took the meandering undergraduate of international affairs to eventually going and getting a, a degree in biology. Um, I worked at the hospital with Dr. Halle Merriam while I was an undergrad. Uh, so I sort of came to college as an EMT, got my paramedic at night, uh, night school as a freshman in college, and then worked in the ER for the entirety of my undergrad, and then came over here to the physician group at the MFA uh, in the world of training and operational medicine. So that's sort of my background. I'm a paramedic, flight paramedic and critical care paramedic. Those are just effectively all feathers that you, you can wear in a hat. Um, but I, I've sort of been a pre-hospital and in-hospital um, provider for the last almost 20 years now. Um, my full-time job is at the training center so uh, as Dr. Helen Merriam noted, I, I work internationally and domestically training physicians uh, in sort of the, the merit badge classes they need for credentialing, but also in the residency training and with sort of outside clients like various other hospitals, the Department of uh, DC Fire, things like that. So a lot of training, uh, that's sort of my, my main job. And then on the side and for fun, uh, I've been on our COVID strike team, uh, going to sort of the underserved areas of DC and, and doing testing. And we'll talk a lot more about that later on. Um, and then just because uh, we, we ran into some issues with making and having appropriate PPE, uh, I decided to start a little offshoot uh, in my spare time of manufacturing PPE with 3D printers, and so uh, we'll, we'll play show and tell later with some of the weird things we've 3D printed and manufactured for the purposes of trying to keep DC healthcare safe. I'm a Scorpio too. Hi, my name is Caitlin Ward. Uh, I'm a PA uh, working uh, with the MFA as well. So I've, I've had multiple trips in and out of DC. I was first here in 2006 after an undergraduate degree in international relations. I think then came back uh, to do my PA, MPH in global environmental studies 
uh, with GW. And now I'm back as the first PA fellow uh, in EMS disaster and operational medicine, uh, which I did after an 18 month emergency medicine residency in Minnesota. Um, I also, uh, our other, one of our other operational uh, leaders here, Drew Morano, unfortunately can't be with us, but he's been the, uh, he started the fellowship and I'm sort of his uh, right hand gal, I guess. So I'm here in his, in his seat for him today, but um, I worked with him uh, on a lot of the COVID management, uh, drive through setups, et cetera, um, and uh, just a general task rabbit for anything that he needs done uh, in, in all, all of the things that we have going here. So it's a pleasure to be with you here today and we'll talk a little bit further about some of the other things that we're doing as well. Thank you both for uh, introducing yourselves. And I think it gives the audience an understanding about the breadth of our team, um, multi-professional, multi multidisciplinary, uh, multi-generational team. And this is, I think, what keeps us uh, strong, what keeps us thinking of new things to do and new ways to do them. So that's one of the uh, underpinnings of our department, but it certainly has served us well as we have come into this uh, new state of affairs. Just a little bit about our city, uh, Washington, I think you can see from that slide, a colorful city. People think of the river that runs through it, the Potomac River. We don't think much of the other river that runs through it, the Anacostia River, and for those of us that live here, the Potomac is a wonderful place to have your recreational activities and photo ops. The Anacostia is the river that really tells us a lot about this city. Uh, it was, as my son, who is a history buff, says, when it was first found, you could see 40 feet down to see the fish at the bottom of the river, but the land around it was dredged for tobacco farms filled in and it became a very polluted, very polluted river. It's just getting cleaned up now. But what we call east of the river is a, a different city than the city west of the river. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Of the two hospitals um, in Washington, D.C. that we work at, the ones I work at, <clears throat> hospital, the GW hospital is in Ward 2. D.C. is divided into eight wards. And uh, UMC Hospital or United Medical uh, Center, the city hospital is in Ward 8. And this, uh, the, the work that I and my colleagues do at the two different hospitals really highlights the differences in the way people live in the city. And I'll talk a little bit about the economics, the demographics, et cetera, that where that river that runs between wards six and eight and between five and seven, how that um, really speaks to the uh, flavor of the city, the disparities of the city, the history of the city. And now as we've come into the epidemic, the pandemic, uh, the way in which the pandemic is playing out in the city. Just a little bit about looking at poverty in the city. Um, GW Hospital is in Ward 2. You can see the first couple of wards there, um, high income wards. UMC Hospital is in Ward 8. You can see the difference in income and you can imagine that that translates into many other differences. And the next couple of slides will just show you a little bit about the tale of the two cities that we live and work in. <clears throat> These are the wards of the city and if you look at the cumulative incidence of COVID, you can see that the same uh, differences that we saw in income is played out with wards eight and seven, which are east of the river, um, and then some in ward five. Ward four is interesting because it's closer to some of the Maryland counties that have uh, problems with, uh, with poverty also. But you can see there's a, a definite difference between the, the wards of the city. Again, looking at the demographics of the city, one thing that all of us have seen over the last 10 years is this incredible rise in property, property values in Washington, 
the gentrification, and of course, gentrification is another way of saying people of color getting pushed out of the city. And you can see the blue, blue represented black in those two central uh, maps there. You can see how it's becoming lighter and lighter and going out towards the periphery. And again, a mirroring the poverty rates in Washington, DC. Of course, poverty is associated with uh, some of the uh, diseases that are um, most uh, difficult to, to treat in our society, underlying diseases such as diabetes, uh, chronic lung disease, heart problems, and of course, asthma has been associated with, and um, other obstructive lung disease has been associated with poverty also. And you can see there that um, color, um, income works its way into the incidence of disease and is reflected also in the geography of our city. If you remember, the one of the hospitals I work at is the United Medical Center in Ward 8. And if you look at the homicide rate, you'll see it's highest in Ward 8. And yet Ward 8 does not have a trauma center. All the trauma centers are, the three other trauma centers are in the other wards. And this, again, we think of violence as a disease um, also, and it has its uh, incidence, it has its uh, risk factors and so on. But if you happen to be a homicide victim in Ward 8, you will come to a hospital uh, closest to you, and many times these are drop-offs because people are not going to call the ambulance because it might take a while to get there. You'll be coming to an ER where I'm happy to say you have an ER doctor there, but there's no surgeon, there's no anesthesiologist on duty. So level one traumas we have to handle, and this in itself can, can lead to some outcomes that are as good as we try to make them, but again, it's sometimes an uphill battle. Looking again at other indications, indicators of inequities, we're looking at the incidence of pharmacies. Again, the lighter, the lighter parts are where there are less pharmacies in Ward 8 and 7. And then children that are on um, CHIP, again, more in Wards 8, 8 and 7. We often talk about food deserts, food, of course, being very important in fighting all the diseases we spoke about earlier, obesity, diabetes, heart disease. And again, if you look on the slide on the right, um, the little blue dots are farmer's markets, the little red dots are grocery stores, and you can see how they're clustered in the more affluent wards and in wards eight and seven. Um, up to this day, really, I, I don't think there's, maybe there, I think they're thinking, you know, or they've just built another grocery store in ward eight, but there was one giant there for the longest time, one giant grocery store, and again, farmer's markets um, uh, for fresh food. But again, that being a reflection of, of um, in, in inequity. Uh, the same thing with transportation. Uh, if you don't have food and you need to get the transportation and the transportation itself is far away from you, that is an additive problem. Again, looking at our city train system, again, Ward 8, not so much in the way of uh, public transportation. Uh, there is bus system, but it's not 24 hours and it's getting spottier by the day. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with that, I'll go back again to our COVID slide and see um, how our incidence of COVID is very much uh, a reflection of our um, inequality that is, again, reflected by our poverty rates in the city. There's been quite a bit in the press about racial disparity and um, mortality in COVID, and again, um, showing Ward 2 and Ward 8. Um, if you look at the blue bar as the percentage of the population in that ward that is of color, Ward 8, the population is highly of color and the death rates in that ward again are much higher. Um, ward two, less people of color, 
again, the mortality rate is much less. And you can really see how stark that is. Another graph, just again, a stark illustration. Also, if you see over time, this stopped in April, this graph has continued to go up along the same uh, trajectory. Um, we're looking at people of color having a much, much uh, higher uh, number of deaths in our city than uh, other people. It's really quite remarkable. And then again, going back to the national picture and just to frame some of the reading that you might be doing, I thought these two opinion pieces in the New York Times were wonderful. I hope you can read them. Uh, one came out in April, one came out in May. And really bringing into question some of the uh, ways in which this differential in death rates has been framed as being sort of the fault of the people that have these illnesses. And I'm embarrassed to say people that I know have said to me things like, well, COVID's just killing people who weren't taking care of themselves to begin with. They were obese and, and you know, what, what, what can be done? They should have taken care of themselves. But a little bit of, of maturity in the way we analyze the numbers we're looking at. Uh, we know that the infection rate is higher in people of color, the death rate is higher in people of color, but when only way we can address these problems is if we start to think about why and how. And I just have these two quotes that said a lot to me. Um, the first one from the April 14th opinion piece, if there was anything you could predict about this, about this pandemic is that the distribution of suffering would have everything to do with patterns inscribed by the past. So we look to history, I happen to have been a history major at Dartmouth, nothing has served me better in my life as a, as a, as a person and as a physician. But again, if we, we look at the wrongs, then we can think of the rights. And again, as we talk about our innovations, we, 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 that's the way we think about our work. And then more recently in the other article, um, opinion piece, this was very telling. Researchers have yet to clarify how a seven percentage point disparity in obesity between 42% in um, the white population versus 49% in the black population translates to a 240 to a 700% disparity in fatalities. So there's more to this than people not taking care of themselves. There's more to this than our food deserts. There's more to this than our inequities in, in housing and transportation. It goes much, much deeper. And again, we need to really get at root causes if we're going to be able to come to a good, equitable solution. Having said that, um, again, in terms of digging deep and finding solutions, when we were attacked by this at first, the fear of this pandemic, and um, I happen to be trained in infectious diseases. Uh, we happen to have put up a response to anthrax, uh, been involved in Ebola, et cetera. And as soon as we heard about this, I just went into pressure mode. And one of my friends who spoke earlier, Dan Lucy, who's my big brother from Dartmouth days and a big brother in um, sort of my career path who's a real epidemicologist and an incredible infectious disease physician. We started talking about this very, very early and we said, look, this is the sucking sound of the tsunami. We are going to get attacked. We have to put up some, we have to change the way we're doing things. Otherwise, it's not going to be good for us. And one of the first things that became clear to me was that as a practice plan, unless we really ramped up telehealth, once stay away orders would come in, we would go broke. Um, and so very early on, we started putting together a telehealth training plan for our um, clinicians. And I'll go through that. And then I'll leave it to Alex and Caitlin to talk a little bit about the ways in which we did our outreach to our first responders and to our population at large. 
So this is just a slide from a paper that we put in that showed how we started very early with uh, training our clinical staff in telehealth. And we went um, from, by the way, seeing 5,000 patients a day in our clinical our enterprise, not just emergency medicine, but our whole multi-practice, multi-specialty multi group. Um, we went down from 5, 000, seeing 5,000 people a day to boom, seeing zero. And in three weeks, we were able to ramp back up. So we're now around week 10, um, we're, we're starting to open our clinics, but we were able to get to about, to about 3,500 visits a day through telehealth, which did something to keep our lights on, I will tell you. It's been really an important part of that. And so with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Oh, uh, this is just an example. You can see behind me the blue screen. We experimented, we thought this was the best way and we set up our clinicians like this so that they could do their telehealth. And with that, I'll turn over to Catlin now, um, who's going to tell us a little bit about our uh, city-based outreach and how we came about that. So early on, we partnered with uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser's uh, uh, team to try to help identify potential weak points in our response and try to problem solve um, some of the pitfalls that we knew we were going to come across. Um, she early on developed a task force with, with four branches, including the Health and Medical Coalition that we're very um, closely interfacing with. Um, PPE and logistics, um, a testing task force, as well as medical surge. Um, you know, right away, as, as uh, we sort of alluded to, we, there was an obvious need to try to keep our workforce and our system operational, which meant partnering with them to get, you know, canceling elective care, moving to the telehealth uh, kind of platform as discussed, and as well as getting bills passed to help uh, with how we can reimburse uh, for the charges for those, uh, um, those encounters to keep us afloat. Um, there was clearly going to be, as we've all hear all day, every day, um, issues in obtaining PPE. Um, we interface very closely with the Department of Health um, and the strategic uh, stockpile to keep those lines open. Um, we discussed the need to set up, uh, kind of improve our testing capability. Initially, the process was exceedingly cumbersome, you know, multiple pages uh, of, you know, forms having to be filled out, et cetera. It was just not feasible. So um, we uh, then partnered with the CDC as well as the DC uh, lab to improve our testing capabilities, uh, including, you know, getting various media swabs, et cetera. Um, as well as test, and then it's also partnering with them to staff and run testing sites throughout the city, um, walk up and drive through. And then last, we also worked with uh, Maria Bowser to sort of uh, try to establish plans uh, for, for the surge that, you know, may or may not still be coming. Uh, initially, the plan from the city was to just say, okay, the hospitals, you're going to manage it yourself, create a plan, go forth, make it work. Uh, and we realized that just wasn't going to uh, ultimately be feasible. It needed to be a bit more of a, um, uh, there needed to be more of a partnership in that. So we established citywide surge plans uh, with, that included, you know, plans for acute care long term, as well as uh, some of our more vulnerable and domiciled populations, which has been a huge portion of our response. Um, we also uh, worked with the government to help set up the convention center uh, surge site. Um, which ultimately uh, was initially supposed to be staffed by the National Guard, but ended up they didn't want to really have that responsibility. So it ended up being uh, a, a partnership amongst the local hospitals. So these are just a variety of ways that we interface very closely with uh, multiple groups throughout the city on this. So it's worth noting just one sort of unique aspect of DC is that we're not a state. And so we're missing an entire layer of emergency management sort of funding, planning, and, and implementation where normally you would have sort of the state government below the Fed and then below the state you'd have county and city. We are one county, one city, one district, no state. And so one of the things that happened was the DC Department of Health had a lot of plans, but not a lot of ability to implement them. And so one of the things we did early on was we set up the COVID-19 call center for the Department of Health, whereby if you dialed 311, the non-emergency help number, 
you would actually talk to us. And we were able to use med students that weren't allowed to go to class as well as some of our telehealth doctors to staff that call center uh, and sort of alleviate some of the burden on the city early on in one of those early partnerships. I may also um, add to that, that um, not only did we help establish the 311 call center, but we also partnered with our DC fire to try to help alleviate the burden of everybody calling 911 for every cough, sniffle, fever that you know they popped. Um, so what we ended up doing was uh, kind of, we did some initial triage and set up a triage system with nurses with DC fire uh, to uh, try to keep those out of the hospital that didn't need to be there and kind of alleviate the burden on the, uh, the 911 system uh, such that if, you know, the patient, clearly if they were needing acute care, we would direct them to the hospital. But if not, we would give them a identification number and get them looped into our system so that we could follow up with targeted testing uh, with our strike team uh, and you know, then take some of the additional transports it needed and put that on our, our AMS uh, transport system. So there's a couple different ways that we're able to continue the continuity of care, but also not overwhelm uh, the 911 system here. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is our fearless leader, Drew Murano, and uh, some of our PAs uh, and other staff from the hospital that uh, have been stepping up in just enormous ways to help uh, keep our walk-up uh, sites going. So we have staff from throughout the hospital, um, several PA providers from the emergency department and other medical assistants from the hospital that have been staffing the tents almost nine to five every single day of the week. Uh, so this is actually a press event that DC Fire put on um, you can see me standing there in front of the soda machine. Uh, but basically, we started a PPE manufacturing uh, arm in an effort to provide DC Fire with some very, very simple things that allowed them to continue doing their job. So they had viral filters, but they didn't have a little piece of plastic that would allow it to fit. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Here's just another another shot of uh, some more outreach that we're doing. We've partnered with uh, Department of, uh, as I said, Department of Health and Labs to go out and test in the nursing homes, which we are all pretty aware that that's one of uh, the major kind of flashpoints for uh, for the pandemic. Uh, so we've been, you know, there's a I think nationwide they put out the call to have all nursing homes, you know, tested and uh, screened, and so we've been doing that locally. Um, we will go out with a team of anywhere from six to 12 people, uh, EMTs, paramedics, PAs, nurses, you name it, and we will screen staff and patients uh, for the virus. So that's been another big lift. It's been interesting because we've been able to test like 400 people in a day mm -hmm. as a team of 12 without making them move. So like Caitlin said, uh, we've done shelters and nursing homes uh, but we've also done like the, the jail. And, and so by not having to move these people for testing, uh, you, you sort of alleviate the logistical burden on the other side of the fence as well. Um, so this is a shot of a classroom in the Corcoran Museum of Art, which has actually been turned into our fabrication lab. Uh, GW had 12 of these printers for a sculpture class uh, and they were just sitting there doing nothing. And, and one of their sculpture professors reached out to uh, me and a couple other people and said, hey, well, what do you think about doing this? And so we've now delivered 2,000 of these face shields to local area practice groups and sort of skilled nursing facilities, as well as the Department of Health and ho Housing Services for sort of their interactions with potentially positive people. Um, this goes back to my conversation about making different manufacturers pieces work together. So, uh, you know, they say that all of these respiratory fittings are standard. It turns out that's not true. Um, and so when we start buying things outside of our normal supply line, we had to actually create an adapter that would let you use different manufacturers pieces together. So this simple, you know, maybe seven cent piece of plastic allowed DC Fire to use their existing equipment with a viral filter so they weren't aerosolizing virus in the back of the ambulance. Yep. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about this um, really wonderful piece of work that Amy Keim and uh, Alex, I know you worked, we all worked on this together. When we first started out, you can see um, we, we had to wear, we still have to wear those spacesuit things, PPE, when we intubate, but we had to use this plastic sheet that was the most cumbersome thing and tried to get under it and tried to put the breathing tube in. And we all know that the time you put the breathing tube in is when you have the most amount of aerosolization. Most of the conversions are happening during this procedure. So we decided we were going to do it with learned with video assistance, but even then it was impossible to do with the sheet. So we started thinking through and finally, after many reiterations, working with maker spaces and so on, you can see on this right, and I just used it the other day for a major trauma victim. And also for, I've been using it really to, we use it now, not just in our department, but it is used throughout the hospital. This really wonderful intubation tent that we use that really has, has, has served us well and um, the prototype is being asked of by many places. Again, I just wanted to show you, I think this is so beautiful. I never thought I would admire plastic so, but it's actually corn. Alex tells me this is all biodegradable corn something or other, and I believe everything Alex says. So just to wrap up, um, we, throughout this time, we found that teamwork and innovation is what has kept us strong and is seeing us through. COVID-19 has widened the cracks we already knew existed in our city. And we live our stories um, later on. If uh, we have time, we'll share a patient's own description of what it's like to be um, to have COVID uh, with you, but we live, we live it. We, our colleagues have been getting sick. Um, our patients, our families have been getting sick. Our city's on lockdown. And we just, through uh, teamwork and innovation, we know that we can make it through the long run. And thank you for your attention. We're open to questions. Thank you. Thank you all. That was, uh, that was terrific and a really good summary of, of what, what you are doing. Um, hang on, am I on video now? Yes. Thank you all for doing that. Um, let me just start by, I, I think I will share the sentiment from everyone who's on the webinar right now that uh, just personally, thank you for your efforts in, in helping the patients. I, I mean, this is a tremendous amount of of effort and dedication on your part. And I, I just want to express on behalf of everyone today, thank you for doing that. It's, it's really great. Um, the audience has been quite engaged in what you've been talking about. So I got a lot of really interesting questions. Um, I look, I see on the clock, we do have enough time for questions, but I, I'd like to ask if you can keep your answers concise so that we can get to, to a lot of them. They're really good questions. So, um, let me start with something that I think someone want, is, is asking you a personal question. I think this is to each one of you. It's how, how do you maintain your energy and your endurance when you're seeing so much of this transpiring as frontline providers? How are you coping and managing with this? Go ahead, Alex. And, and yeah, so, I mean, I think one of the big things uh, sort of from the start was that we realized that this wasn't gonna be a quick and simple like one week and then we're done situation. And so we've, we've sort of had to tighten down the, the sort of community that we, we hang out with and, and what we do in and out of work. And so Caitlin and I are sitting in one office because we sort of in the beginning of this said, all right, we're gonna be doing this for the next couple months. We're just, this is gonna be our COVID family. Uh, and, and so having a, a tight bond with your coworkers that, that allows you to sort of unwind is has been an essential part of it for me at least being able to keep the energy and, and dedication up agreed it's it's the resilience that, that comes from people around you being dedicated to the work they do number one we have an incredible group of patients people have been so wonderful to us you've all seen you know the food that comes the prayers that come the 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 tweets from your neighbors, uh, I'm not on tweet, but the, what do you call it? Uh, the messages, fine. yeah, um, lots of things. Anyhow, just to say that this is a communal effort and it has buoyed us up in every way. I think too, uh, 
of course, we have our own little chosen COVID family, but our family is really, it's been fascinating how it's extended outside of operational medicine. We've created new relationships throughout the city and with other partners uh, that have really, I think, sustained our efforts when you have so many people that you become closer with that you might not other, you know, otherwise interface with under, you know, the public health lab, the Department of Health, yeah. these are people who are, you know, maybe you would talk to once a month or once every, but now they're daily interfaces and it's a whole new um, kind of extension of your family and everybody is so mission oriented. Everybody is so patient oriented that that really, it, it really keeps you going seven days a week. Um, and at the end of the day too, you, you kind of don't have a choice. There's so much of a lift here in the city that and just not enough people really to do it. So I think, you know, the operational medicine group here really does an incredible amount of work for a lot of different groups of people. And just the fact that everybody's so energized and so motivated and so close really just keeps you going. Well, thank it's, again, thank you so much. And um, I have another one, a really interesting question. So were, were the racial and socioeconomic disparities that you observed with COVID-19, were any of those seen previously with H1N1 pandemic in 2009 or with the sort of with the yearly influenza illnesses? So are, how, do, how do you compare the, the, the impact on racial basis and socioeconomic basis between the different diseases? So I haven't seen precise data comparing them. I will look into that. And whoever asked that question, I'm glad to get and back to them offline. We certainly know that um, in influenza deaths are more skewed towards uh, children than this disease is. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly we saw, we see the associated illnesses that come with influenza such as asthma, are more skewed towards children of, at least in our city, of low, lower socioeconomic. It's, it's an inner city disease, asthma, of children. Um, but uh, definitely all disease, and in fact, we just, we just wrote a, a piece, colleagues, uh, colleagues and I, um, for uh, one, of our, one of our journals, and it, it came as no surprise to us that there was racial disparity in COVID because we see it in absolutely every other disease state, whether the disease is violence, whether it's heart disease, whether it's obstructive pulmonary disease, you name it, there is a racial difference. And that is what I was hinting at. There are root causes that we have to really look at our general socioeconomic uh, historical construct in order to understand disease. Disease just doesn't happen without the human element. And the human element doesn't happen without the socioeconomic historical construct. So none of this came as a surprise to us. Yeah, I think there's just been more attention paid to collecting this data than there has been for a lot of the other problems that Dr. Halamariam said. I, I would say that this delineation is probably the one constant across diseases, whether they be violence, sort of seasonal influenza, or COVID. I, I would argue that it's probably uh, consistent across the board. Uh, yeah, this is that, that answer is so interesting to me because so I'm going to ask a follow up question for you all because my my own observation is that the, the COVID nineteen has really blurred the lines between public health and medicine. Yes. And, and how medical outcomes are really very much dependent on, on public health structures and socioeconomic structures. So can you just comment a little bit on that? And how, you know, where do you think we can go to make improvements? And, and um, how do you think we get past the current pandemic and uh, create a better structure going forward? I think the most important thing is to be objective in our analysis of situations. If we let our previously, our assumptions, our bigotries really, get in the way of our ability to analyze a situation, then we can't see the underpinnings of the problem. And what, the, what public health does is it gives us a way to interrogate 
our society from that lens of health and illness as it's played out across groups of people. We're used to inter interrogating illness from the individual, but thinking of that individual as being a part of an ecosystem is tremendously important because disease does not occur in a, in a vacuum. And it's not just public health, but it's also the investigations that come from understanding the ecology of disease that in itself is connected with the ecology of the planet. And Dan Lucy had curated this wonderful exhibit and it, it went through, there's, there, you have to look at every illness in terms of the person, the society and the planet. Everything is, 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 is brought together and public health being one of the ways in which we investigate an illness is just as important when we're looking at one individual as we're looking at a group of individuals because it's all connected. And I do think that our public health education, as is our ecologic education, is not as robust as it should be in our clinical sciences, whether it be training medical students, PAs, our, our primary responders, et cetera. I would say that this also has highlighted the fact that a pandemic like this has really just been a Hollywood uh, depiction to people. And so I think that there was a real reality check and wake up call to emergency managers, hospital planners, but also community organizers and the general citizen that now having a plan and, and really thinking about these things isn't just something that you were told to do and never did. It's now something that you realize is very tangible, real, and can happen. And so I, I think you're gonna see a lot more traction in public health endeavors moving forward from this, given the fact that there's actually now going to be more buy-in and understanding that was forced on people. Oh, that's great. There are several questions coming in around the same, the, the same topic. So I'm gonna, try and ask a singular question to get at this. So several people are asking about telemedicine and, and how this experience, you, how do you feel this experience is going to shape the use and implementation of telemedicine going forward? I wish I had bought stock in Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, There'll be many other Zooms to come, Alex. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I think that, that ultimately telehealth was something that we did uh, like Dr. Helen Merriam said, for like the ship in the middle of the ocean. And the assumption was that having someone come to the office down the street made more sense than doing a telehealth consult until this happened. And now I, I think that the infrastructure has been laid to, to bill for and to reimburse from and to uh, actually do a good physical exam. I, I think that the changes that were made with COVID aren't going to go away entirely. Um, I don't think you're going to have like an ophthalmology follow-up that's going to go well with your webcam at home until the infrastructure gets better. But I do think that a lot of uh, primary care is going to be, if you have the ability to take your temperature and get a blood pressure at home, then we can do a lot of these underserved communities can, can have telehealth as a, as a way to get that off the ground. I do think another thing that the telehealth and the call center, kind of these uh, more tech, you know, heavy innovations have provided is really to fill a gap of communication to the, the kind of the, some of the more underserved populations that don't necessarily have um, access to the normal lines of communication that the D CDC and the Department of Health have been putting out in terms of, you know, web resources and what have you. Um, there's illiteracy is an issue, you know, access to technology is an issue. So one thing that this has really served uh, to do is to, just by giving somebody a number that they can call to get plugged in and then get access to translation services, et cetera, I think has been um, a huge, a, a huge game changer just in terms of improving access to some of those uh, populations. Yeah, that's good. I, Dartmouth Hitchcock here is definitely going to continue utilizing telemedicine in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, they've been doing it for a while, but that this has really sort of shown some of the power and, and the value that it can bring as a, as a way to reach patients. 
Um, I think I'm going to add one thing. We have to be careful as we're going forward that we're thoughtful how we roll this out, that it doesn't turn out to be yet another thing that people that have, have, and people that don't, don't have. Yeah. The digital divide is a very real thing. And there's millions of households around this country that don't have access to high speed, this or that. And then of course you have a fuddy-duddy like me that can't quite turn it on and they don't have a teenager at home to help them. But no, seriously, that, that, that is one of the, uh, as, as healthcare uh, workers, we have to bring that up in our conversation as we're saying, yeah, we also have this other little thing in our toolbox, say, but we need to make sure that you can get it out not just to the people that have, but to the people. That, that is an gone. excellent point. Yeah. Thank you for adding that. That's a really excellent point. Um, you mentioned uh, things are slightly different for you in terms of you're not a, a state. So the question that came in was, do you actually have any advantages being a district? So, state? yeah, I, I think we, we do. Um, so DC has a population somewhere in the 700,000 range which puts us bigger than uh, a number of US states. Our funding is directly congressionally approved. So there is less infighting because it all goes to one place. The downside to it is when Congress shuts down or something else, then our government also shuts down. So we are a little bit more nimble in so much as that we're directly attached to the source of funding. Uh, but we're also limited because Congress can tell us what we can and can't do in sort of a, a framework. And, and so I, I think in some ways it gave us an advantage that we would have had difficulty attaining as a state. Like one of the Dakotas, I can't remember which one it is, but there are more <laughs> people in Washington, D.C. than one of the Dakotas. And so if you think about it, we're also a tiny city. Uh, like the, the, the footprint itself is pretty small. And so in the, world, square miles. Mm -hmm. yeah, in small. the world of delivering healthcare to uh, an area, 65 square miles isn't a lot. And having that much funding and, and that sort of that resource density has, has given us some abilities that I don't think states would have had. One thing we have to say about DC, the population of DC doubles during the day. So yeah. there's an unfunded mandate that comes with that. And it's a fight that's fought out all the time, whether it's in transportation, whether it's in access to this or availability of that. And that's one of the things that we're a little hampered by, by not being a city. But times like this probably can be used to our advantage. Let's see how our politicians work it yeah. out. A, a lot of states right now, as, as most everyone on, on the webinar knows, a lot of states right now are seeing loss of revenues from you know, their tax revenues because of the businesses are, are, are shut down and things like that. So their states are struggling to help support some of these efforts. And so you may have a, a somewhat of an advantage from a, from a funding perspective too. It's, it's, it's linked to the federal funding mechanism, but it's, it still may be, may be an advantage. Can I ask, um, could you describe a, a typical response sequence for when you have indications of a new flashpoint. So how, how does it all come together? What, what are text the communication lines? Sorry? Text messages and cell phone calls. I, I would Usually say- Usually proceed, the, the, some, the, a flashpoint is starting to be reported through the, um, before it comes down channels that are official, it has already started to come down our unofficial channels from our medics that are saying, hey, I'm picking up a lot of people from this, this side of town, et cetera. That starts to come. But then maybe we could, we could so when, when the nursing homes, we really started to see an upsurge. Um, we can talk a little bit about uh, how we decided on the necessity of strike teams to go out. Uh, so you wanna talk about that, Alex, how we, Said, or, and and, and, and well, Caitlin, we said, we need to go. The person to answer this question would be Drew Murano. Mm -hmm. um, and, and unfortunately, he's, he's, he's recovering at the moment. Um, ultimately, a lot of these things have been texted to him uh, from, he, he's just, he's a fixture in DC uh, healthcare and medicine and has been for so long that uh, the, the unofficial pathway 
frequently we get like a two day lead mm -hmm. from his, him uh, and he'll reach out to Caitlin, myself, whoever else on the team he, he, he wants input from, but he'll get a text message that says, how do you feel about testing the whole jail? And mm -hmm. then two days later, a contract will show up that says, could you do this? And so I, I think that it's, it's multifaceted input. It, it's from the owners and managers of nursing facilities. It's from the Department of Health and HEPRA themselves reaching out and saying, hey, there's a need. We don't have the, the plug for that hole. Could you make that plug for us? And, and there's, so there's a lot of very, very informal communication going on that helps us ramp up and plan for and be ready for the potential to go test 200 people tomorrow when we haven't been planning on it. And then ultimately what we'll do with some of these partnerships is we'll say, yes, we have the manpower to do this. We will turn to our partners with Department of Health or with the, at the hospital, depending upon how we're routing the, the contract, try to you know uh, procure supplies from them uh, in terms of the swabs, medium, et cetera. And then we will formulate a kind of a last minute team of anywhere from two to however many people we can get to go out and do the actual manual labor of going to the site, collecting the samples and then getting them back to the lab. So that kind of really completes the loop there in terms of what a day-to-day -day response looks like. Oh, that's really great. So I, I see we're right at the top of the hour. So I, we're gonna have to conclude with that last question. Um, let me just thank you all for doing this for our audience today. And also thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, you instill in me a sense of confidence that our healthcare system can bring the teams together that can really help our patients that, that contract this virus and have, have COVID-19. So I just really thank you for your efforts in, in caring for our populations and, and uh, Godspeed to you. I really, I really thank you so much. Thank you very much for having us. We really appreciate being a part of Dartmouth's efforts and Geisel's efforts, and thank you. Please feel free to reach out to us if there's any additional questions. We're all more than happy to share some of this institutional knowledge that we've acquired over this short, long period of time, however you feel it is thus far. So, Yeah, please, our makerspace. And anybody <laughs> needs shields, Alex, <laughs> doodads to put together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Bye. Have a great Bye. day. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thanks.